I guess I'm chairing this, and I'm also the first presenter, which is kind of awkward. Uh, we also changed around the order uh, in the program, so it makes more sense. Uh, maybe even by the time we finish, you'll 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 know exactly what I'm talking about, because we started with the with the most simple models, and we're going towards more complicated. Whereas in the program, it was exactly the other way around. So I also will have the honor of giving a very very brief introduction of what is behavior genetics. Uh, which I kind of put in the talk, and I guess for the speaker, so 15 minutes each, is that good? Yeah. yeah, okay, so less if you can, hopefully I can too, and, uh, and then we'll take questions at the end. So first, I would like to, uh, um, so this, 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 uh, this talk, uh, this, this study I'm going to talk about is something that is not done yet. It's, uh, it's in progress, and it's, it's, it's something I'm doing with Piritami, and with uh, Lynn Neves, and it is about the genetic underpinnings of survey item non-response. Uh, but before I do that, uh, people make fun of me for this slide because it always goes up, like as the first slide of the presentation, but it's absolutely crucial because I am from the Central European University, and just glancing through the crowd, I think everybody knows where that is, or what that is. Uh, so all I just want to say is, is if you have great undergrads, or even shitty ones, please <laughs> recommend that they apply. If they're not recommended, then send me an email first. But uh, otherwise, I'm just going to assume that, that, that they're excellent undergrads because, uh, because uh, um, well, anyway, I, two years ago, we ended up with a cohort that was uh, exceptionally painful. Um, uh, especially for teaching the mandatory intro to stats class. So, um, so I, I decided that I'm going to actively recruit. All right, so, uh, so the theory is basically um, Thompson et al. published a paper in the Journal of Organizational <coughs> Behavior that uh, is basically it, they looked at if survey non-response is heritable or not, and uh, and came up with the terrifying uh, solution that yes, about 45% of the variation in survey non-response, that is, if somebody responds to a survey or not, is uh, genetically driven based on this twin study. And I don't know uh, if you deal with surveys, that is terrifying news, at least for me, because, because when we analyze these surveys, we sort of rely on the assumption that you know, if people are not responding, at least they're not responding on random, and we have a strong suspicion that that's not true anyway. Um, but it's a difficult study to do because, uh, because people who don't respond to your surveys don't really produce item non-response at all. <laughs> so, um, but they came up with creative ways of looking at this, and they had this like, like running study that goes from, this is, uh, I'm sure you can read this, this is 1986, and that is uh, 2005. What they found was that there was a huge drop in, in, uh, in response in, um, in their surveys, but um, in, actually there, there was a huge increase in non-response, in unit non-response in their surveys, and at the same time they found a drop in item non-response. So they, they theorized that, that there might be a similar mechanism going on at the same time, and I, I thought that was very convincing, and immediately uh, I came to the conclusion that, okay, well, if we're screwed because of uh, systematic variation non-response, uh, maybe we should take a look at, uh, uh, maybe, we should, maybe we should take a look at item non-response too to see if, uh, so what's going on there? Do we find the same systematic uh, variation there? Now, um, now uh, we also uh, did a twin study, and I'm going to take a step back here, and I just wanted to say a little bit about these studies in political science. So, uh, the first study that came out in political science actually just reanalyzed data from uh, from geneticists that was published in like, like I think like what, 20 years earlier, uh, 19 years or earlier there was a study uh, published, and uh, this was the APSRPs by uh, by uh, Alford, uh, Funk, and Hibbing, and they found that genetics plays an important role in shaping political attitudes and ideologies, but a more modest role in forming party identity. The identification, that's something that Zoe's going to talk a little more about here, uh, right after me. And uh, they use the twin design. Now, the great thing about uh, having, uh, having access to, to data on twins is, is we actually have a sample 
that is somewhat genetically informative. Now, twins, um, there are two kinds of twins. There are, there's monozygotic or identical twins, and there's dizygotic or DZ uh, who share 50% of their uh, of their genes by descent. So they're like two siblings, any other two siblings except they're the same age. Now, there are four sources of information that we can extract out of uh, twin samples, uh, and that is identical twins reared together who are genetically identical, um, who are the fraternal twins reared together, and uh, identical twins reared apart, and fraternal twins reared apart. The latter two categories practically don't exist today, which is a good thing. I mean, it's bad for research, but it's a good thing in general. So, um, so uh, we're going to have to stick with the, the previous two categories. So, what do we know about identical twins? Now, identical twins, they look identical, they're from the same egg, they share 100% of their genes, they're basically natural clones, and reared together, they share some of their environment, and they're the same age. Now, fraternal twins, on the other hand, <laughs> might look extremely alike, um, as you can see on the picture here, too, but they only share 50% of their genes. Um, they, they, they don't necessarily look exactly alike. Uh, rare together, they share some environment, just like the identical twins, uh, and they're also the same age. Um, and uh, if, we, if we try to see how we can analyze this data, there are several ways of doing this. <laughs> The early, like pre-1970 approach was to use correlations, and I'm actually going to try to walk you through that. It's a very good heuristic of understanding the methodology that has been replaced by, uh, by more sophisticated methods, structural equation models and uh, analysis of variance models earlier, but structural equation models more recently. So what we're looking for is if identical twins are more similar than non-identical twins, since you know they both were reared in the same environment, we can sort of assume that that maybe the fact that they're genetically identical might have something to do with that higher similarity, and infer that uh, there might be some genetically heritable variation uh, explaining uh, explaining the traits that we're talking about. Now, if uh, if if they're not if they're equally similar, so uh, so identical twins and fraternal twins are equally similar then it's probably uh, an environmental uh, variation that we're picking up on. There's some other, uh, um, I'm just going to go on, there's some, there's some additional things we can look at, but they're mostly relevant for the social sciences. Um, so with correlations, if we want to look at uh, uh, genetic effect, additive genetic effect, we can take the correlation of identical twins and subtract the correlation of uh, fraternal twins you know, we correlate twin one and twin two's uh, uh, trait, and uh, that'll give us, uh, multiply that by two, and that'll give us what percent of the variation is explained by genetics. Now, for common environment, we take two times the, the DC twin correlations and subtract out the MZ correlations, and that'll give us uh, how much of their common environment is driving the variation. So, mainly family, they grew up, but it also could be things like what happened in the womb, so, so that's also a common environment. Um, and unique environment, to just take one minus uh, the correlation I left of the R apparently, um, of, of, of monozygotic twins, and that is the variation that is driven by the so-called unique environment that is unique to each of the individuals. It also contains a measurement error in whatever we're studying, so this is kind of a, a messy, messy trade, but it, it's, it's, it's sort of a leftover residual category. Um, so there are some things to watch out for. There are some assumptions associated with this, and this is discussed and, and back and forth. As you can imagine, this research is somewhat controversial. So there's a, a lot of back and forth going on about uh, assumptions of these models. For example, if we have uh, self-reported zygosity, yes, I'm identical, no, I'm not identical, that tends to be only 95% accurate, but uh, you can do genotyping, you can do also latent class analysis, that's been very successful in, in, uh, in um, producing uh, accurate zygosity me uh, um, measures. 
Also, uh, I think our sample is actually genotyped, is that right? Yeah, part of the, yeah, part of the sample, yeah. Um, influential outliers, so I mean that's the same thing that we have with regression. Uh, you have to pay attention to the means and the variances and the thresholds. And are they different for, for identical twins or non-identical twins because we're assuming that they should be the same. Um, there's the equal environment assumption. This is one that uh, gets some criticism. Is, uh, is, is uh, on average, the assumption is that on average, so not each person, on average, identical twins share the same amount of their environment as fraternal twins. And, uh, and some people say that no, that's not true because, uh, because the twins who, who are identical, they get treated more the same than non-identical. If you ever had twins and talk to these people, they'll tell you that I'm not thinking, is they're, they're running around and there's too many of them. And, uh, and you know, no, no way I'm treating one different than the other and consciously and raising one up differently than the other. Though supposedly this, uh, this is still a controversial issue, at least in the social sciences. And, and there are the additional assumptions that there are no alternative sources of variation. One of the interesting ones is, for example, is we assume that there's random mating, and uh, we do know that people don't mate randomly. That's, that's not a random process. In fact, uh, if you think about your boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, and wives, I'm sure you'll realize that. For example, on political traits, you might be more alike than not. And if you're not, then you're kind of weird as compared to the rest of us. <laughs> so, um, also, gene environment interaction, this model doesn't pick up on that, uh, though the model can be extended, as we'll hear later on, that to, to pick up on that. So, this is the structural equation model we're using that we take the phenotype, or, or uh, in this case, uh, uh, item non-response levels of, of the first twin and then the second twin. This is what we observe, and then we assume that there are these latent traits that we don't observe, but we know how they're correlated, how much they're correlated across the twins depending on if they're identical or non-identical. So the common environment is correlated for identical twins, um, um, the same amount as fraternal twins. The uh, genetic effect is correlated half, 0.5, for, for, uh, for uh, fraternal twins and one for identical twins. And the unique environment that is unique to the in individual, the residual category, are uncorrelated across the twins. And once we estimate this model, uh, we can actually derive how much of the variation in the population. So not in one person. It's not like I'm going to say 40% of your genes drive your political uh, whatever, or your, your I don't know, I'm responsible, but in the population across people, what percent of the variation is explained by genetic factors, common environmental factors, and unique factor, unique environmental factors. Uh, the model can be complicated. This is the common pathway model from the Medlin and Temic piece in political analysis. This actually looks at four traits. There's uh, the, the independent pathway model. I'm not going to go through this. I'm just going to say that it, this can be extended into a multivariate framework. We'll see some of that later on today. And once again, there could be interaction effects and correlation effects. For example, um, genes can drive persons to pick their environment, and that will have an impact on the phenotype and vice versa. The environment can drive how genes express themselves that can have an impact on the phenotype. So it's not a deterministic process uh, at all. It's, uh, it's, there's, there's these interaction effects between the environment. And once again, um, I mean, this is, a, this is a fairly complicated thing that we're oversimplifying over here. So we can have people's uh, genes, DNA, that uh, then influence how amino acids and proteins uh, get produced in the body. And that has an impact on the nervous system and that has an impact on our brain and how it functions. And, um, and behavior can be influenced by environment and interactions at all of these levels. So, but what we're looking at is just this, like not even this, this, how much variation this explains in whatever expressed behavior we have on the other side of the board. So uh, once again, this is a quantitative trait, so we're looking at 
variation in the population, and it's not deterministic. Just because you have one genotype, it's not doesn't mean that you're going to be this way or that way. There is going to be variation, even if you have the genotypes. There's just going to be differences. I'm sure uh, most of you know what the t-test is. This is the sample t-test. That's, that's probably what's going on over here as well. So just trying to say that I think actually this is a less deterministic process than, than the, the family you grew up in because that you definitely cannot change. Gene expression can be changed pretty easily through these inter interactions with the environment. Alright, so I'm going to be brief now because uh, um, there's not much to say about what we've done. We've used the sample, which is the Virginia 30K sample. It is a paper and pencil survey from, from the early 1990s. It's a health and lifestyle questionnaire, so it's not political. We hope to be able to replicate this on a political survey. The reason we went with this one is because it has a huge sample size. We have 2,768 identical twin pairs and, uh, and 1,855 uh, uh, non-identical twin pairs. Response rate for this survey was fairly high. It was 70%. And uh, covariance coverage is over 99%, so we don't have much misery <coughs> at all on, 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 uh, on item on response levels. The only people are missing who just filled out like a half a questionnaire or something along those lines. Now, there were three batteries on this questionnaire. These were like concise sets of questions. If you look at psychological scales, they ask you the similar type of question, and there's like 20, 30, 40 of them. And uh, one of them was a personality battery. The other one was a symptoms and problems checklist, which asks about, uh, I don't know, the back pain, etc. And the third one was, was a Wilson Patterson uh, liberalism and conservatism scale, which asks, asks about uh, political attitudes. And what we found is actually 70 to 80 percent of the variation in item non response levels on these is driven by E. Uh, it's, uh, it's unrelated at all, completely familiar, uh, to, well, not completely, to unrelated to family, socialization, and genetics. Uh, it does include error, though, and I don't know how much error we have in these, these traits. I, my experience is that item non response levels tend to be really messy. They're really hard to predict but with anything. So um, it, it does include error as well. Um, and the rest of the findings are also highly unsystematic. For uh, we get different results for the different batteries as far as the, the leftover 20 to 30 percent variation is concerned. And what we get is the personality questionnaire. The 20 percent is heritable. For the symptoms, symptoms check, checklist questionnaire, uh, it's completely inconclusive. We have insignificant results there. And the Wilson Patterson is 20 percent socialized. The, the item non response levels are 20% socialized. So, uh, in, by conclusion, our original fears are probably unfounded, though, of course, additional work should be done in this area because uh, what we're picking up on is a lot of contextual effects. I just, I don't know if it was the placement of the questions or the type of questions, but we have variation in what explains item non response levels across the three sets of questions. So we hope to be looking into that. I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to do like, like randomized placement on questionnaires, like batteries, that we could, like we haven't talked about this yet, but I'm hoping we'll be able to do that eventually and start looking at these, uh, these questions in a more controlled kind of manner. Um, and, and I guess one of the important conclusions is that we have to start considering interactions between individual level differences and uh, contextual differences. Yeah, on, on item non-response levels. So, thank you very much. I hope I didn't go much.